Слава Ісусу Христу! Glory to Jesus Christ! Welcome to the Catholic University of America. My name is Father Mark Morozovich, and I'm the Dean of the School of Theology and Religious Studies, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome a distinguished friend, a colleague, somebody whom I've known for countless years. No, we got a lot to introduce you yet, Miroslava. <laughs> Someone who I've known for many, many years. Um, I, I have been personal friends with him for probably well over 20 years already. It's hard for me to imagine that. And I have fond memories as a seminarian in Stanford organizing marches and indeed as well here in Washington, D.C. to talk about the Ukrainian Catholic Church that existed underground, that was not legal, and only in 1989 did we see the first instance of that coming out from the underground. So for me to welcome today my dear friend and colleague, on a personal note, it's a great joy and pleasure to hear from someone who I had just read about and to know that after all these years, 20 years of friendship, to be able to talk about his life and to have this great memoir. So, Miroslava, you thought we were done with the introduction, but now we're going to have Dr. Michael Kimmage to do a more formal introduction of our time together. Michael. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Michael Kimmage, Chair of the History Department here at Catholic University. And uh, I'm equally delighted with, with Father Mark to, um, to welcome Professor Marinovich here to the campus of Catholic University this evening, and especially with the undergraduates in the audience, and I'm assuming that there is a contingent of undergraduates in the audience, I would just like to say a few words uh, about the book. Of course, we'll hear from the author in just a moment, but uh, among the many remarkable features of this book, looking at it from the vantage point of a history professor, is in how many classes this book could be taught. So I made an informal list of nine classes in which this book could be taught. We'll just say a quick word about each of them as a way of outlining what's really remarkable and remarkably varied and expansive uh, about this uh, book, uh, The Universe Behind Barbed Wire. So it could be taught in a class on the history of the Cold War, because after all, the themes of the book are innately those of the, uh, of the Cold War, of Soviet politics, uh, of the border between the Soviet world and the non-Soviet world. And it's a book that uh, is, although not explicitly, uh, implicitly about the collapse of the Soviet Union, giving us many reasons to understand why that political, uh, particular political constellation and structure uh, didn't survive uh, longer than it did. Uh, you could fold the history of the Soviet Union uh, into, uh, into this class and, and relate the book to that. Certainly this book could be taught in a class on the history of Central Europe. Uh, itself a complicated uh, entity with its shifting borders and political structures and long and difficult history in the 20th century of various wars and political revolutions and upheavals. And this book has a great deal to say uh, on that front, what Central Europe is, what it constitutes, how it's changed, uh, what it is at the present moment. Thirdly, and obviously this book could be taught in a class on the history of Ukraine, because after all, I think that's probably its most primary framing, uh, what Ukrainian politics, what Ukrainian culture is, spiritual history of Ukraine uh, and uh, the history of Ukraine is something that is not obviously identical to the history of the Soviet Union. Fourth, this book could be taught in, the, in, a, in, a, in a class on the history of American foreign policy. We are after all in Washington DC and one of the important pivot points of the book, uh, which I'm sure we'll hear more about in a moment is the creation of the Helsinki Commission uh, across Europe. It's an important story in Ukraine uh, and in other parts of the former Soviet world. Uh, and this was something that was done partially at the behest of Jimmy Carter and before that of President uh, Nixon. So this concerns an agenda of American foreign policy, which uh, uh, is a complicated and to some degree ironic story what happened with the Helsinki uh, final act, but is a chapter 
uh, in this case, uh, of American history. Fifth, this book could be taught in the class on Christian studies, and we wouldn't want to forget the, the monarchy here, moniker here, Institute of the Study uh, of Eastern Christianity, uh, the various churches and religious commitments that the book uh, chronicles and helps us uh, in this country, especially, I think, uh, to understand. Sixth, in a different sense, uh, this book could be taught uh, in a class on the literature uh, of witness. Uh, this is uh, an extensive body of literature encompassing uh, the Soviet Gulag and uh, the Holocaust uh, in Germany and elsewhere, where there's a long uh, and very illustrious body of literature that helps us to understand uh, this experience from the vantage point of those uh, who suffered uh, from it. So you could place this book next to Primo Levi and Elie Wiesel and other uh, instances of uh, the literature of witness. I think I'll have to expand my points because I didn't quite count up correctly. I think I may have seven rather than nine, but I'll put under literature one further uh, point that this could be taught in just a literature class uh, in general, because the action of the book begins at a statue of a literary figure, not uh, of a political figure, but it's the Shevchenko statue where, uh, in a sense, the drama of the book uh, begins. And this helps us to understand the role of literature, both in people's lives and in the formation uh, of national consciousness. And final, finally, I think that this book could be taught I'm sure you can come up with other classes, could be taught in a course on ethics. Uh, and it's not really, when I think of ethics in relation to this book, it's not so much of a seminar and <laughs> notion of ethics. Uh, it's not the abstractions that you might encounter, say, in Aristotle uh, or other great works of ethical thinking. It's the particulars uh, of ethics that this book teaches us about. What is it to form in life an ethical sensibility? Where does that come from? Uh, what is it... Uh, sort of do for us? What does it do in us? Secondly, what is it to act on an ethical sensibility, especially when the costs for acting on an ethical sensibility uh, are so high as they are uh, in the course of this life story, as they are as described in this book? Thirdly, what is it to suffer uh, for an ethical uh, position, an ethical sens sensibility, to form, to act on, and to suffer uh, for an ethical sensibility? I think that this book sheds great light on that. And finally, you could say, what is it also to, uh, as it were, achieve an ethical sensibility? Because this book is not just about suffering, it's also about uh, many great and considerable uh, achievements. So we'll just say by way of conclusion, when you think of all of those courses in which this book could be taught, all of the things on which it sheds light, it is, of course, a book for history and for historians, but it's in so many ways a book for the present day. So we're delighted to have you on campus uh, welcome, and the floor is now yours. Please allow me to <laughs> take off mask. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Reverend D Dean Morozovich, uh, Reverend Fathers, uh, dear faculty and students, honorable guests. Uh, it's a special honor and privilege for me to be here at the uh, Catholic University of America uh, that is our good partner for the uh, Ukrainian Catholic University. Uh, and you uh, may imagine that uh, I was really, I felt uh, really uh, deep honor to uh, Professor Timothy Snyder from the Yale University that he agreed to publish my book in the series. Uh, Rochester Studies in Eastern and Central Europe and wrote a wonderful foreword. Uh, it was a great honor for me. I thank also the translator Zoya Hayuk and the editor Catherine Younger who visibly improved my original text. Uh, and actually the whole team of the University of Rochester Press and Boydell and Brewer Publisher. 
Uh, I'm glad uh, now that the voices of my colleagues who died already, who died even during the um, imprisonment, uh, now will be heard. Uh, it was my moral obligation uh, to do that. Uh, in the, the beginning of the 90s, when I was asked why I do not write my memoir, uh, I answered, I don't want to think about the past. I want to think about the future. But when the time came when uh, my uh, prison colleagues started to, passing away, to pass away, uh, well, I understood that I have to sit down and put down my uh, memoirs. The structure of the book is very simple. Family life, dissident time, imprisonment, exile, release. Uh, it was important for me to pay tribute to my mother and sister Nadia. They died already and again this is the tribute to them for their invaluable support during my prison time and to my wife Luba who is also still uh, the spiritual support for me. Uh, let me start because I have a pressure of time. I don't have a lot of time to, to, to tell, to speak about that uh, period. Let me start from the moment when I actually uh, was born as a dissident or uh, how a dissident was born in me. Uh, I was, uh, I was pressed or, or I felt deep, uh, big pressure from uh, the um, KGB uh, we, that wanted to, me to become an informer. Uh, at the beginning, I was afraid to say no. Uh, because uh, they uh, even warned me that I will be uh, expelled from uh, the Polytechnical Institute. And uh, fear was my first emotion in my relations with KGB. But two uh, years later, there was a moment when uh, the KGB officer, who was furious that my behavior be became more and more challenging for them, uh, he told me the famous, uh, he rephrased the famous gospel uh, a phrase, and he told me, look, who is not with us is against us. And I told him, okay, I will be against you. So it was the moment when I understood that I'm fed up <laughs> totally. <laughs> I, I have to be free. And this moment was incredible moment of my uh, spiritual release. Finally, I became a free person. So I, my advice is for young people sitting here to, to feel that moment of releasing of uh, uh, fear. Uh, I moved to Kyiv uh, and joined the small but spiritually very powerful group of Ukrainian dissidents uh, and families of those who were arrested at, at that, by that time. Uh, we supported uh, those families uh, of people arrested. We organized uh, some uh, culturally 
important, but very uh, neutral, I would say, uh, events like carol sing singing or Ivana Kupala, that is uh, uh, summer solstice. Uh, but it was still very uh, unwanted for uh, the KGB. Uh, for example, uh, once when we uh, started to prepare the group uh, of carol singers, Mikola Matusevich, my friend, uh, was uh, arrested for 15 days, detained for 15 days, just because the KGB wanted to stop this preparation. But we uh, still uh, went to sing carols, uh, and uh, the police uh, followed us, insisted that we are dispersed. Uh, in, 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 we had passport with, with us. We refused from any alcohol because we understand that, that it, it was dangerous. <clears throat> <clears throat> so this kind of activity before uh, November 1976. Uh, it was the tipping point for me. Mm, the middle uh, of uh, the 70s was very important period in the life of human civilization because the Helsinki uh, Accords were signed by 35 uh, European countries, the United States, Canada, and of course the Soviet Union. Mm. Uh, for the Soviet Union, uh, the two baskets were important military economical. For the West, the third basket, which is human rights, uh, was mostly important because it was the direct impact on the Soviet Union. Brezhnev signed uh, this uh, uh, agreement, being sure that uh, all potentially dangerous people in the Soviet Union are detained already. Uh, in, in particular in uh, Ukraine in, the, uh, in 1972, uh, practically all active dissidents were detained, were arrested and imprisoned. Uh, however, immediately after the Helsinki Accords were signed, uh, in 1976, uh, so the so-called Helsinki groups appeared in the Soviet Union, uh, first in Moscow, then in Ukraine, uh, Lithuania, Georgia, and Armenia. The main task of these groups were to inform the world uh, community about the violations of Helsinki Accords uh, in the Soviet Union and particularly in all these republics. <clears throat> At the beginning, the Soviet Union didn't know what to do with us. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, it, was, it was the first non-underground groups. Our, uh, we put our names on our declaration, our addresses. This information was publicized through uh, Western media. Uh, so KGB knew about us, uh, but they hesitated a few months, but in uh, February 1977, the first uh, members of our groups were uh, arrested, including Mikola uh, Rudenko, the head of the group, 
<clears throat> we uh, all the rest uh, were warned that if we do not stop our activity, we will we would be arrested. We didn't stop, so we were arrested. <laughs> uh, it happened in the in uh, April twenty third, nineteen seventy seven. Um, when we heard knocking in a, in a door uh, and there is a it's it was very funny moment to some extent because there is a saying in the netherlands the democracy is when you hear knock on, on the door you uh, suggest that this is a post office a telegram <laughs> so something like that was in our case there was a knock on the door. Uh, uh, we asked uh, who it is. Uh, the answer was a telegram. We opened the door and KGB entered and arrested us. And so there was no democracy in the Soviet Union. <clears throat> uh, well, the quite new and challenging time started, of course, under uh, the uh, trial. Uh, Mikola Matusevich uh, was beaten during uh, the interrogations and he shouted about that in a corridor. So I heard about that and announced a hunger strike. Uh, I was not beaten, uh, but uh, uh, let me let me mention very important moment <clears throat> in August 1977. Uh, my interrogator uh, told me uh, that you know probably you would not be sentenced at all. Uh, well, I knew perfectly well what he meant. Uh, because it was the time when the Belgrad conference of OSCE started and the U.S. delegation uh, insisted that uh, all uh, members of Helsinki groups arrested by that time uh, are released. Uh, unfortunately, uh, well, and this information uh, signified that uh, the Soviet Union was ready to release us because even my interrogator told me about that. But unfortunately, it, it was only uh, the U.S. delegation uh, that uh, insisted ab uh, about that, on that, uh, European delegations were attached to the so uh, called the Realpolitik. They suggested that this is absolutely unrealistic to insist that the Soviet Union would never release us. And the Belgrad conference was over, and my interrogations were reopened, and uh, I was actually sentenced. Uh, I knew my sentence from the very uh, beginning because uh, the, uh, the condition was the following. Uh, if you do not repent, then you receive the maximum term. I didn't repent, so I knew my term that it will be seven years of imprisonment in labor camps and uh, five years of exile. Um, I was, uh, my hair was cut. I was announced uh, the most dangerous state criminal. And uh, my, I started my way to uh, Ural Mountains where my labor camp was situated. 
the journey was very interesting. The, the etab, a transfer, uh, was very interesting. It is, of course, published uh, and explained in, in my book. Mm. During the court trial, there was, uh, again, very interesting moment. Uh, I defended myself. And at some point, I wanted to uh, quote uh, some phrase by Lenin. Because this quote was in my favor. <laughs> but uh, when judge, my judge, understood what I want to say when I started, he stopped me with the words, uh, stop pronouncing the sacred name of Lenin. Uh, it sounds like a blasphemy in your mouth. <laughs> so this is an excellent uh, moment uh, of quasi-religious nature of uh, communism. I, I love that moment because it, it was uh, very, very interesting. Uh, let me, I forgot to mention that, that when we started to uh, pub publicize our memoranda about violations of the Helsinki uh, Accords, uh, in Washington, the Helsinki Guarantees for Ukraine Committee was organized. And there were several very powerful people involved, but let me mention those who were from Washington. Uh, it's uh, Yuri Sayevich, uh, Yuri Dechakivsky, and Andriy uh, Hrushkevich. Uh, at least these people I, I would like to mention. And this, their support was invaluable for, for us because we could not distribute our materials uh, abroad in the, in the free world, world. and they uh, did that. <clears throat> uh, in a labor camp, the, uh, the choice was very simple to struggle for your human rights or submit to the KGB and the camp administration. Uh, I, would, I have cho chosen the former, uh, uh, held different protests, announced strikes, strikes from the work, stri strikes, hunger strikes. And of course I was uh, punished for that, uh, but there was, a certain pri privilege uh, in that in my position. Uh, I was able, it was very easy to distinguish between good and evil. Now we live in, in, in the world where it is much more difficult uh, to distinguish between the two. But it was uh, very easy. You had all, only to have a spiritual strength to be on the side of uh, good uh, because uh, in this case you are heavily punished so you had to have some spiritual ability to to confront uh, i had wonderful teachers sverstyuk marchenko uh, shevchenko krasivsky uh, but let me give you only one example of their spiritual uh, nobility, I would say. Uh, Valery Marchenko, who died in Gulag. Uh, so we were planning to announce a hunger strike within a week. He knew about that, but before the planned day, uh, uh, came, we changed our minds and held a different kind of uh, protest. 
A few days later, Valery returned to uh, the labor camp and asked us about the result of hunger strike. We explained him that we changed our minds and he told us, well, but we agreed. I took hunger strike in a hospital where he was taken. So we, I was amazed because first of all, he had a moral right not to hold a hunger strike because of his illness. He was heavily ill. For the second, uh, he has a moral right not to take uh, a hunger strike because he was alone in a hospital. So, but he still did it and we didn't. Uh, so it was very, very mm, difficult uh, morally moment for me, but I just tell this story because I want you to appreciate this uh, spiritual nobility of that uh, uh, political prisoner. Uh, the labor camp was a Babylon tower in many senses, in ethnic sense, uh, because uh, many ethnicities uh, were represented uh, there. Mm. By the way, no, no Belarusians and no representatives of the Central Asia rep republics, other were represented. Uh, Ukrainians were always in majority in all, uh, la la all labor camps. Uh, but let me concentrate, because of the lack of time, let me concentrate not on ethnical, uh, ethical, ethnical issues. Uh, I may answer your questions if you uh, would be interested in that, but let me uh, speak about uh, religious aspects. Uh, I'm here at the <laughs> Catholic University of America and it would be appropriate to speak about that. Uh, practicing any religion was strictly forbidden in the uh, Soviet penitentiary system. Uh, you probably remember Marx's famous phrase that religion is the, the opium for the masses. So the Soviet prisoners were diligently protected from this drug dependency. <laughs> uh, the ban concerned all religious groups, uh, but one uh, religious group found itself in a unique position, and I mean uh, Jews. Uh, there was a specific uh, reason for that. Uh, the working week was scheduled according to the Christian calendar with uh, Sunday as a, uh, a day of rest, not Saturday. Saturday was a working day. But for uh, religious Jews, it was a challenge because they uh, didn't want to work and immediately they were punished. Uh, there was a certain cooperation between Jews and Christians for some time. When we uh, prepared some details that uh, we were conducting in advance, to give them uh, and uh, ena enable them to fulfill their quota. Uh, at some point, administration understood that and insisted that they work even when they fu fulfilled uh, a quota. Uh, so it was a special, uh, 
special method of uh, punishment. Uh, interconfessional issues. Mm. We, uh, there was a certain camp ecumenism that was developed in, uh, in our labor camps and other labor camps. Uh, we celebrated Christmas and Easter twice, according to different calendars. And we celebrated this all together because when we are separated according to confessional lines, then it is easier for the administration to punish us. Uh, and uh, I remember, let me give you this story, tell you this story. Uh, I remember the Easter of uh, 1982, uh, an Easter, the East approached, and we were warned by a low, uh, adm camp administration that if we celebrate, if we pray, then we will be punished. Okay, <laughs> it's, it's good for Christians to be punished for a prayer. <laughs> uh, The moment uh, came when uh, we gathered on Easter day. Uh, I prayed a, a prayer. And, uh, then we started to eat some, our small poor food and guards came in and we all were detained in our camp uh, prison, Carter, for uh, 15 days. And we decided that we have to inform uh, the Christian world about that moment. Uh, it was the time when in Europe, so the so-called Christian marches for peace were very popular. And the Soviet Union supported these Christian marches for peace. So on the one hand, he supported Christians in Europe, but on the other hand, uh, it punished uh, prisoners exclusively for a prayer during uh, Easter. Uh, so we decided that we have to uh, manage, we have to try to inform the world about that. And the first, uh, ad addressee was uh, uh, Saint John Paul II. We understood that he is probably the only one who, uh, whom we trust in, 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 among the uh, Christian leaders of that time. Uh, we wrote a letter. Uh, all participants of this prayer, including uh, a Jew, Leonid Lubman, who just came to be with us. Of course, he didn't pray, but he was standing with, with us just to, to support us. Uh, he was also uh, a, a signatory to this letter. Uh, and we, I don't understand how, but we managed to uh, pass this letter to uh, Rome, to the Vatican. Uh, of course, with help of our relatives, with help of Moscow dissidents, this letter uh, appeared in the, in the Vatican and a uh, uh, few weeks ago, we received a letter, secret letter, that uh, John Paul II uh, received that letter and served a mass in, how to say that, mentioning us in this uh, mass. Uh, there were much more uh, 
moments of sufferings, uh, spiritual torture. And let me conclude my initial uh, lecture. Let me conclude with some conclusions, some, some remarks. First of all, I know that for many people in Europe, in the West in general, uh, it is difficult to equate uh, communism and Nazism. And Nazism is considered to be an absolute evil. Communism is a, a Soviet distortion of a rather good idea. It's not the, the, the case, it's not true. Uh, I witness that uh, communism was a cruel and criminal system. Actually, I would, I may even say that uh, thinking about numbers of victims, communism was lived a long, long alive and uh, too many people were victims of communism. Uh, I'm sure that non-accountability of the communist regime led to new crimes in modern times. Putin's uh, regime in Russia is simply the reincarnation of the old uh, Czechist KGB regime. Uh, this regime made deception, hatred, and violence the backbone of its domestic and international policies. Uh, so I'm sure that humanity needs one single moral scale to evaluate the crimes of different uh, regimes. Uh, there is an interesting ironic question uh, of the Polish philosopher Leszek Kolakowski. I quote, should a prisoner languishing in the camps of Vorkuta, its major gulag site in the far north, northern Russia, really have felt happy that he was able to avoid a similar fate in the camps of Dachau? It's a very good question, very powerful question. And the irony of this question signifies that we are far from a just judgment of the history of the two totalitarianisms of the 20th uh, century. Uh, and before I conclude, I want to, want to let you know uh, that my colleagues and I at the Ukrainian Catholic University are trying our best to continue the work that began during the dissident movement of the 60s and 80s. Uh, we have devoted a lot of efforts to promote a healthy interfaith and inter-ethnic dialogue with our new friends in the Polish, Jewish, and Crimea Tatar communities in uh, Ukraine. The struggle for human rights is never ending. And you know that perfectly uh, well. So it needs solidarity of all our nations in these turbulent times. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Maranovich, for this stimulating and riveting reflection. We're going to spend just a few minutes um, with a conversation here at the table up here, and then we'll invite your questions as well. I said that it was over 20 years, and it's probably about 25 or so years already that we've known each other. 
But one question that I think would be interesting for the audience is in 2001, 20 years ago, we were both in Ukraine for the trip of St. John Paul II when he visited. What are your reflections of your impression of having Pope John Paul II there in Ukraine and, and whatever stories you want to tell about your own role in it, which was very unique and specific. Thank you. <clears throat> the role was uh, incredibly important for Ukraine. Uh, Moscow made everything in order to prevent John Paul II of visiting Ukraine. Uh, and on the other hand, we desperately wanted uh, that this happens. And, and we were ha happy when it happened. Mm, first of all, uh, I must say that John Paul II managed to appreciate the Ukraine, in Ukrainian culture, religious culture, religious history, not even mentioning Russia. So it was not a confrontational uh, visit. This was visit of appreciating uh, of appreciating the, the Ukrainian culture. Uh, and it was a lesson for all of us also. Uh, it, it's important uh, to be non-Russian. And being non-Russian does not necessarily mean to be anti-Russian. So this, this is a very, a very delicate difference. Of course, we have to defend ourselves, but, but uh, not being involved in the hatred that is going to us uh, from Russia. Uh, so this message of John Paul II was uh, very important. Uh, I remember that uh, after his visit, during and after his visit, maybe few weeks, weeks, all drivers in Lviv, in, in uh, KU, were very polite. <laughs> they passed, <laughs> they waited for pedestrians <laughs> to go. So it was incredible. The difference was so visible that uh, all people were, so to say, humanized in, in a sense. But it was also a message for me. And let me uh, tell you this story. I was uh, ahead of the uh, papal text service. So we received, our group received the text of papal homilies a day before. And we prepared these texts, uh, texts for distribution uh, uh, about, uh, among media. And it meant that we had to follow uh, his preaching on TV. We couldn't go and be together with all other uh, people. We were sitting and listening on TV. And I remember at the last uh, liturgy with participation of John Paul II, I was told by one friend, look, you are all the time sitting and looking on, on TV. Just leave that mission to someone else and go and be with the Pope for the first time in, 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 so to say, in person. I refused. And uh, it was in uh, uh, June, July. And in September, the same two year, uh, 2001, uh, I was invited to be an auditor at the Synod of Bishops in the Vatican. And I saw the Pope every day during one month, <laughs> sitting in one room with him. 
And I was invited to have dinner with him uh, also at, at his apartment in the Vatican. So you may imagine what gift was <laughs> for, for me because we did our work uh, very, very well. I was awarded with the possibility to be in the Vat Vatican together with the Pope. So I like that. I, I love this moment because it's important for me uh, how important it is to be a responsible person. Okay. I would like to ask you about your childhood and some early influences. You were supposed to become a Soviet citizen, and of course you were, but you challenged, as you mentioned a moment ago, the ethical, uh, sort of the ethical ideas of the Soviet Union, uh, and you resisted. Obviously that comes in part just from your character, but I'm sure it comes as well, and I think you write about this in the book from your parents and your family story and also the region where you grew up. So I was, would like to ask you just to say a few words about what formed you as a young, as a young person and as a young man. Thank you. Uh, this is an in interesting question because uh, I combined two absolutely different logic. On the one hand, I was raised in a family that, what, that was critical toward the Soviet regime. Uh, and it was natural for me to be critical uh, and to be pro-independent, to be pro-Ukrainian. Uh, but at the same time, the influence of the Soviet school was very powerful. Uh, I was in, a Koms in Komsomol, I was a member of Komsomol, the youth uh, organization, uh, and I remember that I was even uh, insisting uh, among some Komsomol leaders that, look, uh, we have to, uh, let us be less, but we want Komsomol to be the true Komsomol, the ideal, ideal Komsomol. So idealism was present in both logics, but a strange combination of the two. It, it was during the school time. Of course, later when I, I understand and I understood uh, what Komsomol means and so on, it was easy for me to, uh, to separate uh, myself from it. it. It happened when I, as a, being a Komsomol leader uh, at uh, the Polytechnical Institute, uh, was uh, told that I have to organize a Komsomol meeting and uh, uh, punish our friend who uh, took a church uh, marriage, uh, uh, church marriage, you, you understand. Uh, I refused. Okay, we organized the meeting, but we refused to punish uh, this uh, uh, person. And it, it was the end of my Komsomol career. And uh, so as you see, it was a combination uh, I couldn't avoid uh, that influence of the Soviet uh, ideology. Uh, I may even say that uh, during my young time, uh, youth time, I was uh, indifferent toward religion. Uh, it was then in uh, the labor in labor camp in, in, under imprisonment when uh, everything changed in me. And you all uh, remember the, the famous, uh, well-known uh, phrase, uh, verse from Matthew, 
2536. I was in a prison and you visited me. Uh, so God is the first to do what he is calling us to do. So he is coming to all those who are in, in prison, who are imprisoned, uh, being innocently. Uh, that's why his presence was so powerful for me that uh, I became obviously religious there in, uh, in, in a labor camp. But sorry, I moved from <laughs> childhood to prison time. <clears throat> Let, let me ask a, a, a further question, sort of moving forward in your life story. I'm curious how it felt to observe the collapse of the Soviet Union. And of course, Ukraine played an important role in the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, you mentioned understanding the Soviet system as criminal. And I wonder if that didn't make you wonder whether it would collapse even in the early 1980s or the 1970s, or if you thought that the Soviet Union would last longer and its collapse came to you as a great surprise, what was it like to see the events of 1989, 1990, 1991? Uh, uh, your father uh, will help me. It is St. Augustine probably that told uh, that truth is like a, a, a lion. Uh, don't touch it. It will uh, win the struggle with uh, uh, deception by itself. Uh, so deception and the system of deception uh, is very powerful at the beginning, very powerful. And it might be powerful for a long time. But finally, the day comes when then this system collapses under the weight of these lies. And uh, let me uh, just illustrate that in, in my fate. <clears throat> uh, what, what was wrong in this communist system for me, finally? It was the permanent lie. I couldn't survive, in, I couldn't manage to live in a country, respect myself and repeat the same lie. So that was the moment when all these <clears throat> lies uh, were too heavy uh, to be uh, tolerated. Uh, that's why uh, it was, uh, I, I may say, it was a, a proper time for the communists to collapse <laughs> because uh, people couldn't uh, tolerate that anymore. So thank you very much. Now we're going to have some chance for people from the audience. If you just raise your hand and we'll have the microphone brought to you. I was wondering if you had an opportunity to work with any of the members of the Ukrainian political movement, Ruch. Uh, Ruch uh, was established in the 90s, at the end of 80s and in the 90s. Uh, and at that time, um, I was freed already. I was, uh, I was released in 1987, uh, but I didn't join the, um, all these political uh, movements because uh, I was absolutely sure that I cannot be a politician. <laughs> uh, so this is not my way, definitely not my way. Uh, even more, uh, I was sure that people who have old 
stereotypes, all models of the building in their minds would be unable to, bid a diff to build a different building. So I wanted to be uh, uh, connected with something that is changing people's minds. And Ukrainian Catholic University is an excellent place for me to do that, to, to convince young people to change their minds and not to think in the former uh, communist uh, uh, way. Uh, of course, uh, Rook movement uh, invited me uh, to be part of this. I supported them Mm. Uh, in a journalist way, uh, I published several articles in supporting of them, but I didn't, uh, I was not active personally. Thank you very much. You mentioned uh, uh, your experience uh, while in prison, that you encountered a kind of an ecumenical experience encounter with uh, all the Christians in the group in, in the camps. Could you please uh, say a little bit more about um, this relationship, this ecumenical relationship between various Christian groups uh, in the common experience of, you know, uh, communist suppression? Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, let me say uh, from the very beginning that confessional differences were not so important in a labor camp. Uh, first of all, because no, no rituals <laughs> were allowed. So there was no places to uh, demonstrate your confessional uh, preferences. But uh, having this permanent struggle between good and evil, uh, it, was a pers uh, it was important, uh, not that you are Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant. It's important whether you have a spiritual ability to resist the evil. And this was the main, uh, the main uh, question for you. Uh, that's why mm, we, mm, we supported each other uh, without uh, paying too much attention to uh, confessional uh, moments. Uh, there was a Roman Catholic priest uh, punished at that time, uh, it was Father Alfonsas Swarinskas. Uh, of course, it was not possible for him to serve liturgies uh, in, a, uh, in a labor camp. What he did uh, was he held some spiritual conversations with many people, and again, uh, without any distinguish between a uh, uh, confession. Uh, that's why uh, later for all political prisoners, uh, it was difficult to accept the period of development of Ukraine when in, at the beginning of the 90s, uh, the whole... Mm, uh, Stalin's key let Pochautano. Uh, the, the, the Stalin's uh, yes, yeah, Stalin froze and all religious uh, <clears throat> preferences and so banned many, many uh, religions. But in the 90s, all these uh, <clears throat> ice started to be melted down. Uh, that's why some uh, changing of uh, your orientations, of, uh, uh, of your mm, uh, 
confessions, let's say in this way. Uh, for many people, it was the moment of, uh, of making a choice. Uh, and at that moment for us, it was strange that people uh, may uh, go into conflict with, with each other, for example, Catholic with uh, uh, Orthodox, but wait a minute, why? We have to be good Christians, first of all. Now, this experience of labor, uh, prison ex uh, ecumenism was very important uh, for us even later. Thank you very much. I was wondering um, how you view, possibly explain, and evaluate the growth of misinformation in the West, the power of the... And how dangerous, how dangerous you see this. Yeah. Thank you. I am sorry. <clears throat> For me, uh, lips language is very important, but uh, in the time of masks, it, it, it's different, difficult. Uh, actually, this is a tragedy for me. Uh, because again, in the uh, prison time, uh, there was a land of values, it was the, the West, and there was anti-civilization of communism, the land of anti-values. Uh, and of course, I wanted Ukraine to join the, uh, the, uh, the democratic world, to be part of it, <clears throat> and to, uh, to uh, accommodate all these values. Now I see more and more that uh, the Western civilization, and I speak very gener generally, uh, is becoming the world of interests, sometimes very egoistic interests. Uh, let, let me mention just one example. Uh, North Stream 2, uh, Germany, and uh, the whole the position of Ukraine and, and, and so on. Uh, the, the issue of uh, post-truth means that uh, we are losing something very important uh, when we speak about democracies and when we speak about uh, future development of mankind, I, I, uh, I mean the ability to distinguish between good and evil, between truth and uh, lie. Uh, during my time, my dissident time, I remember that when we heard the voice of America, for example, radio voice of America, then we understood, oh, that is truth immediately. We could distinguish between truth and evil. Mm, now uh, it is more and more difficult for people to make this uh, uh, distinguishing. I was told by my colleague, my prison colleague uh, living in Moscow, that in Moscow, all the information necessary is available on the internet to understand what, what is going on in Ukraine. But people suggest that this information is false because they hear the propaganda voices of uh, Russian government. So uh, 
unfortunately, the same, the same inability to distinguish between uh, uh, truth and lie uh, is, or I would say, start starts to 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 be uh, present in the West also. I'm sure that Brexit happened uh, partially because uh, th there were too many fake news uh, in in media, in social media. Uh, that's why people were dis disoriented. Uh, you know the situation in the United States better than than me. Uh, I would be afraid of uh, analyzing uh, this uh, here in this audience, but I am I am really afraid about this land uh, of values. I am afraid of the land to whom I wanted Ukraine be proceeding. Did, are you satisfied with my answer or not? Maybe you rephrase your... Uh... Uh, I, I hesitate to ask a question because I came, about, came in about three minutes before you ended. But uh, I do have a sense of uh, what you may have been talking about because three weeks ago, I was participating, well, not participating, I was witnessing a doctoral defense of a dissertation uh, at, at Notre Dame University on uh, Ukrainian dissidents, and you were one of the sources, and you are either quoted or referred to on every other page. So with that, I dare ask my question. One of the uh, points the author of this dissertation, which was very successful, by the way, um, uh, one of the points she made was, in her view, there was no real dissent movement in Ukraine until the Helsinki, the formation of the Helsinki group, that there were individuals in various parts of the country who were coming up with their own different analyses, but there was not the kind of network. And the, the networks really, you know, uh, developed uh, with the arrests after the uh, Helsinki group. Uh, was formed and the, the networks and the movement developed in the camps. Now, you mentioned that you are involved in the uh, a movement for reconciliation with the Jews and Crimean Tatars. And I'm wondering, what was your experience with these groups in, the, you know, in captivity, shall we say? Uh, and did that experience influence the way you view them today? And I would be very curious how you do view them today as separate nationalities, as Ukrainians of a certain type, and what might have been the evolution in your thinking about these people? <clears throat> Thank you uh, for that question, because it gives me an, an opportunity to, to speak about eth ethical, ethnical uh, issues. Uh, yes, you are right. Uh, it seemed to me that Jews and Ukrainians met each other for the first time there, <laughs> met in the sense that we started to hear the pain of each other. Uh, we are, were on the same social basis. Uh, our cut, uh, our hair was cut in, <laughs> on Jews, Jewish ha heads and Ukrainian heads. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we started to analyze our difficult history, history of our relations. Mm, there were a lot of discussion, very honest discussion because uh, we were punished for <laughs> uh, saying truth so it was okay for, for us to to tell truth uh, and i uh, remember a very funny moment in my conversation with uh, semen luzman simon luzman mm, uh, 
he asked me uh, what guilt of Jews uh, are in perceptions of Ukrainians. And I answered that for many Ukrainians, Jews are responsible for creating and flourishing communism at the beginning, uh, during Bolshevik times. <clears throat> and uh, we discussed that and he finally said, okay, if we even are responsible for creating this system, we would definitely be responsible for destroying it. <laughs> I love this. And actually, uh, the movement, the Jewish movement uh, for uh, having right to be de for deportation to uh, not deportation, to, be, to, to go to Israel, uh, this movement was at the beginning of the dissident movement in the Soviet Union in general. So to some extent, it is uh, 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 truthful. Then uh, Crimea Tatars, uh, I didn't uh, uh, make acquaintance with uh, Mustafa Jamilev, the famous Crimea Tatar uh, leader, uh, in, in my labor camp. But all of us knew about him, knew about Crimea Tatar's movement, and uh, all of us uh, uh, unanimously supported Crimea Tatars in their uh, will to come back to Crimea Peninsula. Uh, this solidarity uh, is valid until now. Uh, in the year 2016, uh, I and my colleagues at the Ukrainian Catholic University organized the second Crimea Forum in Lviv at, on the basis of our university, giving Crimea Tatars a, a space, a platform to discuss their uh, issues, uh, to discuss the um, human rights violation in occupied Crimea and many other uh, issues that are connected with their uh, life now. So, in general, I may say that uh, in positive inter-ethnic relations in uh, uh, a labor camp in, in Gulag started to be a, a basis for <clears throat> a new Ukraine, for new Ukraine in an ethnic sense. Uh, I remember that in, uh, at the beginning of the 90s, uh, very powerful conferences on Jewish-Ukrainian relations were held uh, in Kyiv and in Jerusalem. And, and again, dissidents, former political prisoners, were the core of uh, these uh, people who discussed all these uh, issues. So it, it was very important uh, for us to be there. Um, so my question is, um, Primo Levi, he wrote an essay called The Gray Zone. I believe it was in The Drowned and the Saved where he said um, when he was in the camps, it was very difficult for him to distinguish between good and evil um, because the Nazis made prisoners, um, like kill other prisoners, basically. Um, so what struck me the most when you spoke was that there was just a very clear distinction from good and evil while you were um, in the gulag. Um, why do you think Primo Levi couldn't, like why he sort of struggled with that, I guess? Uh 
if I understood you correctly, if not, please uh, um, correct me. Uh, first of all, because the main uh, administra camp administration was our main uh, uh, enemy. And you know that this feeling of a common enemy is the best uh, clay, clay, blue, blue uh, to, for people to be united. <laughs> so, uh, one uh, thing. Uh, then, it was because of that. Uh, you uh, you was able to rethink some uh, issues which were not clear before. And let me give you one example. Uh, a Jew, uh, Simeon Blusman, was sitting in our camp uh, dining room uh, together with two U uh, Ukrainians uh, who were arrested for their UPA resistance. Uh, they were members of Ukrainian uh, UPA. Ukrainian insurgent army. So uh, <laughs> please say it loudly. Ukrainian insurgent army. Army. Uh, so, uh, for uh, Simon Glusman, it was a very interesting moment because if he uh, thinks about that in, uh, in Kiev before his arrest, he would be very negative towards these people. But being there, he understood something very important for him, that these people were struggling for their freedom as he is struggling for the, his free freedom as well. So uh, they were sitting, uh, they were uh, communicating in a very friendly manner. And it was KGB who wanted to, to, to change that. <laughs> they, uh, and he describes that in his memoir, KGB officer started to speak with him. Look, these awful nationalists, Ukrainian nationals, Banderovsi, how can you, a Jew, speak with them? And the, the same officer spoke to them. Look, you are Ukrainians. And this is awful Jew. How can you sp talk to them so friendly? Uh, so, you know, this truth uh, was, was naturally uh, uh, raising in this atmosphere. So it was easy to distinguish who is on the side of good and who is on the side of the evil. Am I correct? Hello, thanks for your talk. Um, I was just wondering if you ever read any Dostoevsky and if he had any influence on your thoughts um, and your opinions on the government, anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, during my uh, time when I was in school uh, and in at the Institute, uh, I was fascinated by, by his writings. Uh, the famous question uh, of uh, Ivan uh, Karamazov uh, is still important for me. Uh, and many people in uh, prison uh, also put that question, uh, is God good if uh, at least one person is suffering. So it was it was very uh, vivid question in in, in a, a, a labor camp. 
I may give you one example of a uh, Ukrainian political prisoner uh, who managed to escape to escape from the Soviet Union to Iran successfully, but unfortunately, the U.S. intelligence interrogated him, but he was not interesting for the, for uh, them. And Iranian government took uh, him back to the Soviet uh, authorities. It was a tragedy for him because he received 15 years of imprisonment. And I remember that when we were in one cell, uh, and I spoke something about God. He just uh, exploded. Don't speak about God to me. <laughs> because uh, if uh, God agreed that I was taking back to uh, uh, the Soviet Union, if he allows that, then he is uh, uh, responsible for uh, I, I, I understand the pressure of this pain. That's why the question of Ivan Karamazov and Dostoevsky is still, is still important for all of us. Um, do you, did you ever have any contact with Yuri Bezmanov? Or are you familiar with Yuri who that is? No. no. No? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, there is. Pani Maranovic, I just wanted to ask you if you could share a little bit. I know you've been very involved in the ecumenical movement and interfaith dialogue since uh, since you've uh, been uh, over the last five years. You've done a lot of work with. Uh, with youth and especially interfaith youth between Jewish, Christian, and Islamic young people. If you could share a little bit of your recent works with the, the Kovchak project in particular, the Kovchak. This is our favorite project, our favorite uh, event. So uh, in the year 2006, we decided that we want young people to discuss uh, all these difficult issues of our history uh, all together. So we organized uh, a Kovchak uh, project, uh, the Kovchak project, ARC, ARC project. Uh, we invited uh, 10 Ukrainian citizens of Ukrainian origin, a Ukrainian ethnic uh, origin, uh, 10 Polish uh, ethnic Ukrainians, and uh, uh, 10 uh, Jews in Ukraine. And it was very successful. Uh, we started, these young people discussed all this difficult history. There were uh, national days uh, when all these ethnic groups uh, uh, discussed uh, their uh, culture, explained culture, religion, and so on. Uh, but uh, in the year 2014, after uh, Crimea Peninsula was occupied by Russian, by Russian Federation. We decided that we want Crimea Tatars to be part of this project. So it became a four-lateral project. Uh, uh, I was a little bit afraid at the beginning how it would work, because now we have three religions. Uh, but it was, it was really fantastic, and it is really, uh, still really fantastic. Uh, I remember the very moving moment when we uh, demonstrated uh, the 
film Khatarma uh, Crimea Tatars about the deportation of Crimea Tatars uh, from Crimea Peninsula. And uh, uh, Crimea Tatar girls started to cry. And it was Jewish uh, girls who approached them, embraced them, and uh, expressed their uh, sympathy. Uh, it was very, very touching. Uh, and I suggest that this project is very powerful uh, instrument for, uh, again, uh, learning um, and how, how can we be able to uh, hear the pain of each other to understand, to feel that. Uh, so it, of course, we cannot uh, pass all Ukrainians through this project because uh, it's a big country, but uh, we do our best and uh, I'm very satisfied with that. Thank you. Professor Marinovich, I wanna thank you for visiting us this evening and presenting your book and for your reflections. I've drawn one conclusion, which I'll sort of mention as my final thought for the evening, that the barbed wire has come down in much of Europe, but the questions of good and evil that you've been you know, thinking about and struggling with and working on your entire life remain very much of the present moment and have not gone uh, anywhere. So for your insight into these questions, uh, once again, we'd like to Thank you this evening. And I think you'll hear a few practical words about how to purchase the book and how to get the author to sign it in just a moment. But thank you so much for joining us this, this evening. Thank you. Thank you. It's always a deep pleasure to have you here with us, my dear friend. Um, it's been a, a great journey. And for me, it's personally was very moving. When I first traveled to Ukraine, it was in 1994. And then it was a few years after that, that I got to meet um, Professor Marinovich and his example, his life, his stories, but most of all, his friendship over the years have been a great source of joy and comfort for me. And you can have some time to chat with him individually the book is available in the back as well for inscription and signing. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. And thank you again. Thank you. And sorry for my awful English today. I'm, I'm, I'm furious. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.